If you speak Norwegian or in, in, Indonesian, I can't even say it, I have subtitles for you available. But I also need you to contact me. Please email me at timbc at gmail.com so that um, I can have you do an intro in your native tongue. Thank you so much. Voor Nederlandse ondertiteling, klik op de drie puntjes bovenin, dan op ondertiteling en vervolgens op Nederlands. Vi har nu ondertekst på svenska. Klicka på sluten bildtext och väl svenska. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos al kanal de Timbaxea. Ahora con sus títulos en español. Oké, okay, so I'm here with my mate. And I want a lot of you have asked if uh, what it was like to have. Uh, I mean, a lot of you have seen the day in the life of a tugboat captain, and some of you have asked to see more of the crew. And finally, after lots of persuasion, I've got my mate to come on camera with me. So, anyway, this right here is Danny, and Danny is what he's we'll give you a little, I'll have him introduce himself and give a little uh, history of where he came from and that sort of stuff but basically as far as how I know Danny he had worked for this company for on another boat and done this thing for a while and then when he was ready to be trained he ended up being trained on my boat and we were lucky to have him for a few hitches and then he went and trained on another boat and ended up uh, with a spot opening up on my boat and snatched him right up. Danny Maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, you, uh, where you where you grew up, what you came, how you uh, you know your background as far as wanting to get into the field, and whether you went through the hawse pipe or you went uh, in a maritime school. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Southern California in San Diego. So kind of grew up in in a coast town and really liked being by the water. So when I graduated high school, I wanted to find a career path that would keep me by the water, so I kind of figured maritime, that makes sense. And uh, I was recommended to apply to a maritime academy, and I ended up applying to a couple and got into Cal Maritime in Vallejo, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I went there, and it's a four-year program, so I'm, I'm like Tim, who went up through the Hawes Pipe getting all his endorsements and certifications, STCW sign-offs, he got all of them on his own. I had a very... Well, I, I did it the hard way. Oh, yours, yeah. is much, yours was the desired route. You were just, you You continued to prove that you're much smarter than I am. <laughs> no, it, it was, that's the, one of the main advantages of a Maritime Academy is it's very structured. It's, all you have to do is what your instructors tell you and four years later you're going to graduate with a third mate unlimited or a third assistant engineer uh, license. So the Maritime Academy route is something I kind of fell into. I was just told to apply. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I'm incredibly glad I did. It is a very general maritime education, which has pros and cons. One of the pros being that it starts from square one. I had never stepped foot on a boat a day in my life before I went to Cal Maritime. So they start out with which one's port, which one's starboard, uh, and they go up from there. So if anyone's trying to get into the field, I would recommend Maritime Academies. They bring you up from nothing, and they give you a very rounded education. So most of the classes, most of the curriculum is geared towards deep sea big ships. There are a couple small boat classes. There's a, we had a tug and barge class, but out of four years, a majority of them are for deep sea shipping. But the all around education primes you for any part of the maritime sector. So I went and got a general education came to tugs and I had the base to learn tugs. I have friends who went to river uh, ferries in Alaska. They had the 
primed knowledge to learn that, to learn piloting through restricted waterways. I have friends who are going to the MSC and going across the ocean, going to the Middle East, they're able to learn these things because you have a base set of knowledge where you can get to a job and learn on the job and be able to develop spe specific skills, uh, which I thought was the main advantage of the Maritime Academy. You, you know, that, that brings, a lot, a lot of people ask me how I did it, and when I came up through the Haas pipe, that the Haas pipe is something that's a, a path that's shrinking due to the increased regulations and more, more uh, things that we need to do. And to put that in perspective, Danny, and I don't mean any offense by this, he, he came out of school with a license, a scope of his license that I will never see in my career, but with very little uh, experience, where I, the Hawes pipe kind of looks at, does it exactly the opposite, where you start with experience and through experience and other things you slowly get to where you are. Years ago, the Hawes pipe was a really good option. It's becoming less and less of a good option, and I'm stuck right now, and in my age and where I am, I kind of like doing what I'm doing, and that's fine. However, Danny is at a really good spot in his life where he's got a great job and doing what he likes doing, and he's good at it, and that's good, but he can continue to move up, um, where for me to move up would be a, a, a huge expense of money as far as classes, when you're going to class, you're not getting paid, and um, it, it, like I say, the, the you know a lot of people will say, oh, four years going to a school. Believe me, it would take me over f if I went if I went and just started to try to on my off time go to school. In over four years, I still wouldn't have what Danny has now. So so yes, there's a balance that you have to figure out between experience and coming out with all the credentials that you need. It's not just the license. It's not just that. There's a whole bunch of things. Um, our company just expanded to the West Coast and they had a whole a, a, a bunch of equipment that went through the Panama Canal and did all that. And that's been a lifelong dream of mine. And I couldn't do it because the scope of my license doesn't include what they call an oceans license where Danny already has that. That, uh, and, uh, you know, and there's a whole bunch of other certificates that you would also need as well. But, but Danny has all that stuff, and that's what you get when you have a formal education like that. So, so um, let's talk about how you made the transition. When you got out, oh, now, some people don't know that while they go to school, they have a, do you call it a sea semester or something like that, or, or a, a cruise, right? They call it a cruise? Yeah, you, you do a couple of cruises on your school ship, and then each academy calls it something different. But basically, an internship where one summer you spend 100 some odd days on a commercial vessel. You go get an internship with a real company. Uh, so when I did mine, it was my sophomore, junior summer. And I went uh, to Hawaii to do tugging barge. So that was my first time on a tugboat. Uh, and that is. And you're sailing as a cadet at that point, right? Yeah, you're sailing as a cadet. So it's kind of up to the boat, up to the captain, up to the company you sail with what you're going to be doing. Um, I've had like how much responsibility they give you? Exactly. I, I was, when I was on, I was basically acting as an AB. Uh, learning how to dock and sail a barge, work lines. We did our own tanking on, in that company. We tanked the barge, so discharging and loading, uh, general seamanship. So I got a taste of everything at that company, and it was what confirmed for me, okay, tugs is what I want to do. So the remainder of my two years at school, I had my set set on what I want to do after that. So, so you graduated, you got your license, you're all set to go. What was the next step? Apply to everyone who will accept an application. Excellent. Uh, and 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 was what was th this company? We don't have to name any names. Was this this company the 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 one that you ended up going to? Yep. I mean, obviously you did in the end, but I didn't know if you had gone one in the in the interim. No. Uh, this was uh, my first job out of school. I applied to everybody, and mm, the Maritime Academies love to tell you when they're recruiting that we have a 
97% job placement rate uh, within a year of graduation, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's kind of true. Um, not all companies are always hiring. We're in the oil business. If oil isn't doing well, companies don't hire, companies lay off. Some companies do well, others do badly. So not every company is hiring all the time, but uh, if I can think of my friends, I don't know a single one who didn't get a job within three months of graduation. So I just shot out applications, uh, got a call from our company's uh, recruiter and came in, got a job, started started as a deckhand. Excellent, excellent. So. Cool. So, so, so it's important to realize that that you know. Uh, sometimes I see in some of my comments. Sometimes uh, people will write to me and they'll say, "Hey, I have a license. Can I come be a tugboat captain?" And uh, it doesn't really work that way. Like I say, he's got a massive license, and uh, he has to start at the bottom, and so would you. <laughs> so that's kind of how that works. So, so you come over here. You work as a as a deckhand for a certain amount of time, and then you um, now. Did you, uh, did you have to actively pursue with the company and tell the company, look, I want to, to move up, or, or were people rooting for you to help you? To, because I never knew you before then. Um, all I knew is that they told me one day, oh, you've got a new uh, trainee that came aboard. But, but was that something that you had to go out and push for yourself, or they just figured that you had a big license, you were a kid in school, and you had Good, you were written up well with the company, and so they moved you along anyway. Uh, little both. I when I was applying, I kind of made it uh, clear to HR and uh, the fleet coordinators. I want to do this. I want to drive. Um, but at the same time, they see someone graduating with uh, with a third mate license. They kind of assume, okay, yeah, he doesn't want to be. Uh, he doesn't want to be a tankerman, probably. Yeah. He doesn't want to. Uh, you, you've invested time and money. Yeah, he's not going to be an engineer. So. And just so you know, when he says he's a, it's a third mate, that's a third mate's unlimited on a ship. So, like these 1,200 foot container ships, he could be the third man in charge on that. So, so the third mate's unlimited is still a much bigger license than my lowly old captain's license. So, don't let the third mate, it's the unlimited part about that, and he can go anywhere in the world with it. So, that. That's amazing. So let's talk about, about when you came over. So I remember, <laughs> this is kind of funny, I don't know if you are cool with me sharing this with the world, but I remember um, crew change is always a crazy time and people are coming and going and I'm getting on the boat and doing my crew change exchange with the other captain that I'm relieving. And I had gotten a text message from a fleet coordinator saying you're going to have a trainee on board. That's all they said, a trainee. And we have a lot of uh, deckhand trainees that come by, obviously, but there are a lot more deckhands than there are mates. And so Danny's a young guy, and uh, I said, hey, are you the trainee? He said, yeah. I said, okay. And so <laughs> I was thinking that he was, because he's so young, I was thinking that he was going to be a deckhand trainee. <laughs> Oh no, he's a mate. <laughs> I didn't realize that. And so, anyway, I, um, so we're gonna. I, I want you to talk to her a little bit about how the training process worked. But before I do that, um, this is no surprise to you because you know, I've, we've gone through a couple of evaluation cycles. But uh, Tan Danny was a joy to uh, teach, and there's some things that um, I talked to you guys about because you you might find this as well. In, in your walks of life too. Obviously, it's easy to train somebody that wants to learn, and that's number one. Number two, it's there's some things that you can train, some things that schools can teach in a book, but there are other things that you kind of have to have almost like an, an extra sense about, and that's about whether how everyone wants to use the horsepower and, and to muscle your way in when Mother Nature's gonna run she's going to write the last chapter anyway. So if you can figure out how to utilize the wind and the tide to do the, the lion's share of the work, you're really good. And Danny was somebody that picked up on that very quick. And I was really surprised because usually the people that do that are people that come from a fishing background, people that grew up on the water doing all that sort of stuff. And where you just kind of walked into this, you, you did really well. And Danny came along as one of, uh, one of the... 
very successful student that we had with us, so much so that when we had an opening, I was very happy to grab him, and he's been here ever since. Well, why don't you tell us about how the training process worked with you? Like, uh, what, what were you, you know, tell us, were you apprehensive about it? Or what were some of the things? Um, maybe you can talk about how, at first, I just want you to watch what I'm doing and I talk about it, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, first, first hitch training with him. Um, first week, I didn't touch his throttles or, the, or any of anything. I just sat and watched, and it can be, it can initially feel like, but I'm not training. That's a very crucial time because it's a lot of responsibility. There is a lot under your control when you're you're at the helm. So for Tim or any instructor training someone. Uh, to just have you watch and kind of narrate what they're thinking while they're doing what they're doing. It's very helpful because uh, the training process is really intimidating, or at least it was for me. Um, you're moving and, and, a lot and, and, of... And it's relatively quick too. You have about three hitches to either yeah. fit in or get out. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, it, so, so you have to be on your ball and uh, I, I think that one thing that I tried to do as a trainer, not only training you but any, with anyone for that matter, um, I talk a lot in my videos about the old Portuguese captain that taught me everything and uh, one thing that he was really good at that I try to emulate is not just saying this is how you do it but actually vocalizing the thought process that's going through my head. So in other words, instead of saying me, I have to get the barge to the dock over here, I say, okay, I'm looking over here, the wind's over here, I'm concerned about this, I feel my stern sliding this way, those sorts of things. And that was something that helped you. Exactly. Um, it's, it's a lot to think about initially, and um, you just, the training process is more, at least I saw it this way, as can you get a sense of the end goal? Can you have a broad enough view of the situation to know what's happening and what you need to do to get to the dock or get off the dock, whatever? For situational um, awareness, right? Yeah, right. so if you're, if you're getting blown onto a concrete dock and you don't have the wherewithal to know what to do yeah, you you have a small that? window of opportunity to, yeah. to, to, to correct that, or you either correct it or get out, or there's going to be an issue. Yeah, so that, that's what I think the training process is, is do you have that sense, can you learn that sense? I, I didn't have to admit to begin with, I had to learn it. And once you have that bird's eye view of your situation, you know what's happening, you know what needs to happen, then it becomes experience and repetition, 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 doing it over and over and over again, day in, day out, because that's how you get good. So I've, I've been a mate for a year now and I'm still learning every single job I'm learning. Uh, I'm not a rock star by any means. I am learning every day. I have jobs that don't go as well as I want, and I put it in the back of my mind for next time, so. And you know, that that's part of the process too. I mean, uh, uh, there's a, a captain that I look up to that told me years ago when I was cutting my teeth and I landed really hard on a ship, he told me, he goes, Tim, the only thing all these tugboats have in common is they're covered in rubber. <laughs> so there's a reason for that. Things go wrong and anyone that can tell you that they've never done any damage or they've never had a bad day is either lying to you or they haven't done any work. And uh, So the thing, you know, uh, to quote my old Portuguese captain again, you know, he says, find what scares you, the job you hate the most, and do it over and over again. And uh, there's a particular dock here, I'm thinking IMTT 9 in the yeah. corner there. That, that's, that's one that, that, that I still am wigged out about, and all the jobs have come up on his, his watch. He goes in there like nothing now because he's done it so many times. And uh, that, that, that's kind of that repetition thing. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's cool. So, uh, so, so was it, was there any adjustment for you or by being young and being um, in a dorm scenario and all that, was living on a tugboat with the different personalities basically where five dudes on a hundred foot steel island, 
Um, was there any part of that that was difficult, or was that just something that just kind of came naturally to you? It's it's honestly a crew by crew basis. Um, no, that's very it's, fair. Uh, just getting along with each individual personality. Not everyone's always going to gel well, but it, you all have Large personalities are usually drawn to this line of work as <laughs> yeah, well. So. If you're out here, you're always a little crazy. Yeah, but, a, it, I mean, you're all there for the same reason. You're all there to do a job. So everyone's kind of on the same team regardless. So it, there'll be spats, but it's everyone's there for each other. No one's out to get you. They're all there for the same goal. So it's, it's not bad. It's it's very similar. I had an older brother I shared a room with growing up. Uh, that's pretty similar. <laughs> You're not making tons of noise when the other guy's trying to sleep. You're not uh, <laughs> just going through all his stuff. You just common courtesy and if you tread on someone's toes, be the bigger man, apologize there and you go. do differently in the future. <laughs> Excellent. So, so we need to wrap this video up, but before we do that, can you uh, kind of walk us through, I mean, it, you've seen my video of a day in the life of a tugboat captain. So I, in that video, I explained that there's two watches. There's my watch and Danny's watch. We call it the front watch and the back watch, and that we both work six-hour watches. Danny has the boat from midnight till 6 in the morning. I have it from 6 in the morning till noon. He has it from noon till 6 at night, and I have it from 6 at night till midnight. And that keeps going back and forth. And if you haven't seen my Day in the Life video, be sure to click on it. But uh, can you kind of walk us through what an average day is for you? Yeah, um, average day starts at midnight for me. So wake up and check the night orders. We have on our computer, just the company orders, take this barge to this dock at this time, get one off this ship at this time, and check Tim's night orders. Uh, Captain Ham writes his own night orders. It's a little more clarification. If Tim's still up uh, and around and not <laughs> getting ready for bed, don't want to bug him, I can, I usually- And, and we, we, we write those night orders too, not, not just for me to put them for him, but the, it's part of the vetting process that our customers want to see that there's communication between the two of us. So yeah. uh, all that happens. So there's there, there's multiple layers of uh, yeah. direction for you. Yeah, and the night orders and all that are, are good and all, but I usually make a point to get up early so I can catch them before. And we can have a little bed. interface between then what's going on, this is what happened, I heard this. Yeah, like I'm going to this dock, here's what I'm concerned about what's your advice, how would you do it? I, I make a point to get up early to catch him. I'm still learning so to ask him what he knows from his experience. So as soon as I get that info from him, I take over the watch and do whatever jobs come up. Um, on the mate's responsibilities that are different from the captain's are things like voyage planning, uh, if we're going out of town, just plotting on charts, uh, making up uh, schedules, updating charts, uh, making sure, just checking equipment basically. Every every day we do a big long checklist. Hey, when's the last time that fire extinguisher was uh, checked? Are you sure it's charged? Just maintaining the safety equipment, stuff like that. Um, and then, then you take your, your nap from about 6 in the morning till noon, right? Yeah, so all those responsibilities are just general mates duties. Apart from that, it's basically the same as Tim's. When I were on duty from 9 to 6, I make up the barges, I move them places, drop them off, go get another one, just like Tim does. <laughs> Until 6 in the morning, then we have that same uh, handoff where uh, if we're up in the upper wheelhouse moving a barge, I'll come up, hey, where are we going? Uh, when are we supposed to be there? What's the, what's the tide doing? What's the wind doing? You have a handover. It can last five minutes. It can last 15. It depends on what's going on. It's, so, sometimes it's nice, too, especially when you work with the guy that you work with, if you have a good rapport. Um, I, I, I'm one of those guys that I, I feel that I wake up, but I don't like coming on watch and getting right into it. So in other words, if he's approaching a dock, He'll work another 15 or 20 minutes to put it into the dock for me, so I don't have to jump in. And I like to do the same thing for him as well. Well, listen, 
I thank you so much for coming on. Hopefully you'll inspire more of the crew to do as well. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I don't know if you've heard, but the engines just started up and the chief turned on the blowers and alarms are going off and uh, we're getting ready to get underway, but I wanted to thank, take this opportunity to you. Thank you for watching the channel. If you haven't subscribed, please do and, uh, and make sure you comment. Big shout out to Danny for uh, manning up and coming on camera. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny. <laughs>